And this is our last background slide on this. So your progesterone. And you could also, and I did it a little bit different on this slide, I kind of gave you the dichotomy there between estrogen and, estrogen and testosterone. There's also the dichotomy between estrogen and your progesterone too. So you got to think about both of these. And this is the reason I say that all these hormones are very interactive with each other. So with uh, progesterone is produced in the adrenal gland, but in uh, cycling females, you're also looking at the corpus luteum here, and that's the reason you get the changes in the, in the menstrual cycle. Uh, basic role, support of pregnancy, and it's going to relax smooth muscle tissues. Uh, maintain stem cell activity. So if you've got, if you think about this in terms of someone who is, you know, let's think about it from a musculoskeletal viewpoint for, for a minute here. If you've got someone who chronic uh, joint pain, chronic bone pain, things like that, or they don't really heal very well, the fact that they don't have chronic stimulation to the stem cells to differentiate into these other types of cells, this may be part of the reason that that patient's not, not really healing all that optimal. Okay. That's the reason we can't really isolate one, one area in the body. It's kind of that reductionist viewpoint. It's not very effective most times. And then progesterone also has some anti-inflammatory anti properties, but granted, they're nowhere near to the extent of what your cortisol-based anti-inflammatory is going to be. So now let's look at some, that was the traditional thought process on this. Here's our non-traditional thought process on this. And this is, this is so much of the reason why I tell you that hormones cannot be looked at in the traditional viewpoint. And we've got to think about, we've got to think about the mechanisms of what they do outside of just sex-related characteristics here. So if you look at these first three hormones here, the pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA, you, if you're not familiar with this, you'll see it when I put the, the flow chart up here. These are far upstream hormones. I mean, these are more your more upstream hormones. They haven't differentiated down into your in-stream hormones yet. But the, the bottom line on this is that these actually have physiological roles too. We can, we can think about things like progesterone and DHEA. I just gave you what some of those were. But most people only think about pregnenolone as its role as a precursor to other hormones. Well, pregnenolone, if you look in the literature on this now, actually has physiological roles of its on its own. There's things that it's doing by itself too. And then you get in between some of these hormones with these conversions, you get something like this allopregnanolone produced. And that's actually going to be an intermediate in between, in between these hormones, but it has a physiologic role as well. It actually has a calming role in the brain. So when we talk about, um, let me just use a real quick example for you. You know, when a female, if you think about uh, in terms of PMS, one of the characteristics of PMS can be irritability, right? So if you look at what's happening there, you're seeing it, you're starting to get to the point where the estrogen levels are coming up. So if you don't have the balance of the progesterone to compensate for that, then you get too much neurological excitability associated with the irritability, and you don't have the calming nature of progesterone to offset that with. So that's just kind of looking at, and it's really, it's these metabolites that are actually having those neurological effects and stimulating those neuroreceptors. But here's something else that I thought was pretty interesting in looking at this. It's synthesized in the central nervous system. So these things aren't, aren't necessarily synthesized in the adrenal glands or in the, the uh, testes or ovaries. They're actually synthesized at the site of, of function. So where they're going to be used at, that's where they're going to be synthesized at. So that's kind of a whole different mindset around what we've kind of traditionally thought about with regards to hormones themselves. And it's so much of, if you look at so much of the things that we all see on a day-to-day -day basis and ultimately what, where they can end up, there's this huge contribution that of the inflammatory process, and we know that one of the main things associated with inflammation is decreased neurological function. If you ask your patients, hey, how's your memory, how's your... Um, how you, how you, uh, how's your motivation on a day-to-day -day basis? Most of them tell you, mm, my memory, mm, it's not quite as good as it should be right now, right? Or my motivation's not as, not as significant as it has been in the past. Those are all indications of neurodegeneration. Um, so if we look at some of the other things that our, these neurosteroids are going to also do, increased synaptic function, myelination regulation of neuron cell life. So, this is what's going to offset that neurodegeneration, and it's why those hormones have to be present in adequate, in adequate levels, but not too much. Right? There's a balance in this. And then aldosterone, this is one that 
I never really have understood why the labs don't put this in with the panels, like the, the salivary labs. I mean, they're looking at pretty much all the other steroid hormones. It seems like it would just make sense to throw this one in there too. Because you have to think when you're looking at the, at the chemistry profiles and some of the shifts that are happening in those electrolytes, you know you're going to have changes with the, with the effects on the sodium, with, on the effects of the potassium, and just water balance in general. So with aldosterone, it's going to fall into the category of what's known as a mineral corticoid. So basically trying to balance out predominantly your sodium and potassium, but you do have other electrolytes in there. But if you get patients that tell you, hey, I drink a ton of water and I'm still thirsty, or I drink a lot of water, and you run their total body water percentage and you're not seeing that shift to any significant degree, this has probably got something to do with that. But again, you can, <clears throat> you can run a blood level on this, and it's, it's decent, it's not bad, it'll get you in a ballpark, but it, I think a, a salivary level on this would probably be a little bit more ideal. But again, nobody really tests that. So that's, that's the background.